University of Washington. And I'm here to uh, kick off the Seattle Grand Challenges Summit. I'd like to introduce our media host for today, which is uh, John Markoff, who's a technology correspondent uh, for the New York Times. And we're lucky to have John with us. To say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. So I've been thinking about uh, the, uh, the, the question of why grand challenges. And uh, I thought what I could do in the, uh, the first just five minutes or so is uh, give you a bit of context where the term grand challenge came from, um, a bit of history. And uh, then I'm going to come back at the very end of the, uh, the day and, and uh, run a short Q&A with some of the panelists and presenters. But uh, the term originally uh, was first used in the context of science and technology um, in the late 1980s. In 1987, the United States was very worried about a, a particular challenge. Um, the Japanese had started a fifth generation computing project. And the Japanese at that point were a fierce economic competitor to the US. And uh, there was great fear, particularly in Silicon Valley, that we were losing uh, our lead in the computing world. And the fifth generation project was uh, an attempt to build an artificially intelligent system, a computer, and we all know how that turned out. But back in the 1980s, it looked like they were gonna be able to do it in about a half a decade. And so there was a great concern, and the US basically set out uh, to maintain its lead as the maker of the world's fastest supercomputers. And uh, it actually had a, a tremendous impact um, that we're still feeling today. It basically transformed the way uh, things are made in a, in a sort of profound sense, that we built a class of machines that could be used in the design of advanced products. But I wanted to go back, um, backwards even farther, but before going back, um, the next sort of big use of uh, the term, um, a former DARPA director in, in uh, 2004, Tony Tether, set out a grand challenge to develop a autonomous vehicle that could drive more than 100 miles through the, uh, the, as it turned out, California desert under its own propulsion and under its own navigation. And uh, DARPA put forth a million dollar prize and that really sort of got the competitive juices going both in universities and in uh, research centers around the country. And uh, the, first, the first effort um, in, in 2004 was just a tremendous failure. I think the, 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 best, the best vehicle could do was, I think, seven miles out of 120 miles. It ended up sliding off the road. But um, DARPA doubled the prize, and 18 months later, uh, a group from Stanford uh, designed a car that, that actually did it and, and succeeded. Um, and actually, it turned out to be a great race. It was a very exciting finish um, because we didn't know who would win until the, the very end. And uh, it also gave me the distinction of being one of the few people in the world who's been in an accident in a robot car at speed, um, which was really, since everybody, nobody was killed, it was really quite exciting uh, to <laughs> go off the road in a robot at 30 miles an hour. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to, to, to jump back to sort of try to make the case that these grand challenges really can change the world. And, um, you know, in Silicon Valley, where I come from, um, the word visionary is really tremendously overused. I mean, people put the word visionary on their business cards. But I do think there is a class of people who I'll, I'll say have a, a clear sense of what's possible. And I wanted to give an example of one of those people um, who, who did have that sense, who, who really did change the world and who is, I think, underappreciated. But it, 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 gives, it gives you that sort of framework if you set a goal um, to try to achieve something in science and technology, um, you, it can have a, an impact far greater than one, one might think. So in response to another challenge in the late 1950s, the, the, the Pentagon set up something called the Advanced Research and Projects Agency, which was supposed to, to uh, not let the U.S. suffer technological surprise in the future. And uh, it was in response to 19, 1957 launching of the Soviet Sputnik satellite. And there's one person who became a DARPA program manager during the 1960s who I think has had a tremendous impact on the world by setting these kind of grand challenge goals. Um, his name's Robert Taylor. Um, he's now in retirement, but he was a young program manager at DARPA, at ARPA, now DARPA, in, in 1960, well, actually, I'm sorry, first as a program manager, he was a physicist trained at, at UT Austin, and uh, first as a program manager at NASA, he funded a, a young computer engineer at uh, Stanford Research Institute, a man by the name of Doug Engelbart, 
to invent the, the computer mouse. And then in 1968, um, he took a job as a program manager at DARPA, and he sat down in his office, and he had three computer projects, and he had three computers talking, one computer talking to each, pro to each project. He immediately realized uh, the value of an internet. And so he did something about it. He funded it. He had written a paper in 1965 with J.C.R. Licklider, Licklider called The Computer as a Communications Device. And it was, it was uh, Taylor's funding of the ARPANET that kick-started um, what we now have as, as the modern-day internet. And in 1968, still at DARPA, he funded Doug Engelbart, who had been sort of beavering away at SRI on all the things that you now use as modern personal computers and uh, as, as networking. And he funded something that you can see on the internet, and you should actually go look at it, called the mother of all demos now. Engelbart showed interactive computing to the 1,000 best computer scientists in the world in a single demo in San Francisco in the fall of 1968. Everything you use was basically there. It's simply a simple matter of engineering to refine it. Um, and then in 1972, uh, Bob Taylor had left, uh, had left uh, the Pentagon, and he'd gone to Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, and he funded sort of a group of troublemakers who were sort of uh, not on the page of where Xerox was going to design the first personal computer, a, a computer called the Xerox Alto. And of course, along came five years, six years later, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and they each borrowed some of those ideas and built the modern per personal computer industry. So one person with a clear view um, can have a huge impact, and of course there's there's a, a, a veteran prognosticator in Silicon Valley who also says, um, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. And you can see that from the first funding of the, of the mouse in 1964, it is now you know, 40 years later that it's a standard part of our everyday lives. And I wanted to leave you with one caveat, too, because we now have the ability to design and create technologies that can transform the world. And, you know, it doesn't always work out uh, as we've planned. I think you can take a look at what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico now and s see the possibility um, that all of these advanced technologies can have that can have a huge impact in, 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 the, in the world in both positive and, and negative ways. And so that puts a special responsibility on the designers to think about the consequences of what they design. And so let's get into the first uh, keynote talk. And that will be delivered by uh, Professor Nicholas Pepys. Um, You'll get a full bio uh, of his and of all the speakers are uh, in the program. But the short version is, is that uh, he holds the Fletcher Stuckey Pratt Chair at the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. He's chair of the uh, biomedical engineering uh, department um, uh, at Austin. And I'm not sure whether I call you the father, the godfather, or whatever of drug delivery systems, uh, but clearly has been uh, at the early stages of the developments of these technologies. And so please join me in welcoming Nicholas Pepys. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm delighted to be here to address students and faculty and members of the academy on this very important problem of engineering better medicines. Um, we are at a crossroad in the field of medicine. Some of the things we have been doing for years do not work. As a good colleague of mine and member of the National Academy by the name of George Giorgio said very recently in Texas, we have learned how to cure millions of mice from cancer. <laughs> Unfortunately, not so much has worked to humans. And so we're really at the crossroads where we have to start looking again at what we're doing and trying to define the next generation of medicines. But as we do that, we really have to address some other questions. Who's paying for these medicines? how they're going to be taken by the patients, which type of patients are going to take which type of drugs, how are they going to be delivered, can the governments afford this, will FDA or any other organization around the world that approves 
drugs and medicines and so on, be able to approve them in a reasonable time to save people? Is the public willing to pay for that? I hope that this talk and the talk that Susan Pan will present immediately after this will set some of the goals of the particular discussion because I hope that the panel discussion will really try to answer some of these questions. I'm going to cover one aspect of the problem and then Susie is going to cover another aspect. As Matt O'Donnell already said, the National Academy of Engineering took a leadership position three years, three years ago by coming up with the challenges, the grand challenges. And last year we had a meeting in Duke in which the first guidelines were given. For me, two of those challenges are biomedical in nature. As you can see, we have major questions in the area of advanced health informatics, and of course the other is the subject we're discussing this morning, engineering new medicines. Now, as we look at engineering of new medicines, we are looking at a variety of questions. For example, engineer, for example engineers are expected to develop new systems, and to use genetic information to sense small changes in the body. That is very important. And I'm talking mostly to the graduate and undergraduate students. Your generation, hopefully, will see this particular question coming to fruition. Hopefully in 20 or 30 years, we will be having systems, which may be nanoparticulate systems or some other systems that uh, will be able to sense a particular analyte that is responsible for a particular disease and start treating the patient. We're having also major questions on assessing new drugs, and you will hear also that there are many questions related to technology that will be able to be used for assessing the drugs. And there is a number of applications, such as delivering vaccines. In fact, last week we had the first such announcement of the first vaccine for cancer. But as I said, the world of therapy is changing. And as it's changing, what is becoming important is that we as scientists need to be first and foremost citizens, responsible citizens, who are at the same time looking at how what we are doing is going to be brought to the patients and commercialized. I wish we were in a society where all the new developments were paid by big governments and they were brought to all patients in the world for the benefit of society globally. As you know, that's really far away from reality. And I'm going to return back to 1968 and fighting in the streets to see how my generation was looking at what the world was going to do. Obviously, we didn't do all the things we were planning in 1968. But we have some serious problems. The world of therapy has changed. The governments, you, the taxpayers, you, the patients, expect that there will be lower cost of the products. Everybody wants simpler use of medical products. One of the major questions that is going to come up during the discussion is patient compliance. We have a wide range of drugs that can be taken by specific administration routes that are not really desirable to the patients. The patients forget to take them, or they don't want to take them. So we have so many unfilled prescriptions simply because the patient is not compliant. We want product safety. And we have to realize that there has to be product safety for everything that is put out there. I was in a conference last Friday on healthcare at the University of Texas at Austin, where there were many members of the academies and so on. And a medical doctor interrupted and said, gentlemen, you do not understand. If I fail once, I lose my license. That's the end of my career. That's the end of my mission in the world. And that's what we have to understand, that product safety is a sine qua non 
You cannot do it without, you cannot say, oh, in 99.9% .9 of the cases it worked, but in one case it didn't. We want to have early diagnosis, and we know that that is really the right way to go, uh, mostly because we prevent serious side effects of diseases, and the patients, of course, can live a longer life if there is an early diagnosis of the disease. And finally, we have turned our attention to what I would call major diseases, major causes for death, cancer, HIV, heart diseases, and so on. And especially for the students in the audience, I say HIV. Yes, HIV, because the problems in medical sciences are global. Because we cannot afford not to pay attention to what really happens around the world. The fact that in Lesotho, an independent country in the region of South Africa, there is now 37% HIV cases. It's not something I'm concerned by the United States. This is one world, and we all have for the improvement of the quality of life of all patients and for the improvement of medicines that are given to those patients. And as you start are really easy to apply to a patient that works in a field without water, without electricity, without the use of it. So the change in world of therapeutics, of drug delivery, of biomolecular engineering, has been a really significant change for us in the biomedical field. It has led to advanced structures, advanced systems, systems that are supermolecular assemblies, self-assembled structures, hybrids that contain biological components and synthetic components, and why not even all kinds of microfabricated structures. And the University of Western Seattle is one of the leaders in these particular developments. So we've done well, and there is much more to be done. But as we look at that, we have to see really what we have to face. This is a map presented by one of my graduate students of how diabetes mellitus is going to be in the year 2025. And if you look at the darker colors, those represent countries where we will have at least 14% of the population having diabetes mellitus in 2025. We are talking about epidemic proportions. We are talking about having a large percentage of the population in the Americans, in Europe, in Asia, even in some of the northern African countries having really diabetes. Are we ready for it? Are we producing the new drugs? Are we coming up with the new treatments that will be used for that? So what NAE does with the Grand Challenge, this is very important. It identifies really new ways for these new drugs. As Matt O'Donnell said, it addresses questions about how to come up with our own personalized medicine. And my colleague, Susie Pan, in her second talk, is going to give a very nice analysis of some of the developments in this particular field. But I want to pose a question to you, because you are all also uh, consumers, and I'm pretty sure you visit CVS or Walgreens or whatever else exists in Seattle. And you may have seen announcements like the one in the lower right side, Start saving today more than 5,000 brand name and generic medications. Over 400 generics priced at $12 for a 90-day supply. Wonderful. We protect our people, old people that suffer from disease and that don't have money. They can get their medicine. Who pays for all that? Do we import these drugs from India and China and Israel? 
These are three of the countries where major generic companies exist. And what's going to happen to the major pharmaceutical companies that are asked to come forward with the new developments of medicines? And when Professor O'Donnell and I and many others in this panel talk about engineering new medicines, what do we propose that we do with these new engineered medicines? Who is going to bring them to the market? Ladies and gentlemen, in the year 2006, the company Nectar, after a long work on the research of pulmonary delivery of insulin, had an agreement with Novarti, uh, excuse me, Aventis, Sanofi Aventis now, and with Pfizer to start distributing the first pulmonary delivery-based insulin system for type 1 diabetic patients. And this started in October of 2006. After a long effort on research development, I understand, although I may be wrong in those numbers, that they spend anywhere between 750 and 80, 800 million dollars to develop this particular product. And I understand that all marketing people were expected, expecting that the first year this product, which is called Exubera, was called Exubera, was going to have a market of the order of three, two to three billion dollars. Well, the market, the product was introduced in the market, and believe me, there were many, many animal studies and human studies and clinical studies and panels had evaluated the product, and the product was going to be delivered by a particular applicator, which was originally very long, very big applicator, eventually became smaller and smaller, it was going to be delivered to patients. I'm not going to go through the whole analysis of what happened, because it's not really part of this discussion today. Uh, but let's say some of the doctors objected, many of the patients objected, there were special types of tests that had to be taken, such as the famous lung test, before they could start using this particular product. So, a year later, this led to Pfizer making the, <laughs> making the big decision to simply remove the product from the market. Because a year later, the market had only, was only $3 million. And I'm giving that to you as an example for the last question. We cannot leave the room today talking about the wonderful new designs of drugs that can someday be used in patients without addressing at the same time the financial question and at the same time the response of the public and, of course, how FDA is going to approve those systems. So when you look at all these drugs and all these systems, realize how much work has gone behind them and how that has to be paid somehow. On the very left in the middle, you see one of the most successful engineering products. This was not exactly a medicine, but it was a device. These are the little wafers that were developed by Bob Langer about 25 years ago to treat brain tumors. They were placed directly next to the tumors and they were able to release a particular drug for a long period of time. That was a product that was commercialized by a small company. It's still being used. It has improved the quality of life of a large number of patients, not everybody that suffers from this disease. And you're going to see all kinds of systems like the Lupron Depot and so on that have become very well used in the field after a lot of work typically of the order of half a billion dollars of uh, research. I'm particularly interested in methods for oral delivery of therapeutic agents, oral delivery of therapeutic agents such as proteins because these are the materials that are really major medicines, major pharmaceutical products, major therapeutic products for a variety of important disease, diseases. And the benefits would be the increase of patient compliance, the low cost, and the ease of administration. So in my mind, where an AE says, let's develop the new generation of medicines, and when you look at the fine points, it's also let's develop the new methods of better administration. Patient compliance is very, very important, especially in type 1 diabetes, because the present systems cannot really allow such proteinic drugs to be taken in a relatively simple way. 
why are we so excited about transmucosal or oral delivery of proteins? For the simple reason that the patient will have an easier way to accept that particular drug. How many patients do you know who suffer from diabetes or multiple sclerosis and they don't like to take injections? Now, in the case of diabetes, there is no other solution. If they don't take their injections, the shots, a few, a few half an hour later, they're going to have a major problem. But in the case of multiple sclerosis, the, 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 the side effects are not as obvious and not as immediate. So I know many individuals who conveniently forget to take their injections of interferon beta. Who knows what they do to themselves. So coming up with better methods of delivery of those proteins is very important. The cellular pathways for the delivery of proteins are really paracellular and transcellular. And what we're trying to do is deliver those proteins without denaturing them, without losing the pharmacological activity, deliver them to the blood over a period of time. You're going to hear from Susie the same question addressing now intracellular delivery for treatment of diseases such as cancer, where we have additional problems to face. You look at some of these proteins. Insulin is different from other proteins. It has its own characteristics, its own physical chemical characteristics, its own PI, and so on. And as of course you know, the main function of it is predominantly in type 1 diabetes. Calcitonin is another protein that is very widely used right now and developed for these types of applications. Calcitonin is used for the treatment of postmenopausal women who suffer from osteoporosis, and the market is increasing again since other possible drugs have been found to have some risks. And that has led now to the, the scientists to go back to calcitonin. Erythropoietin is another major application, another major protein that is used in the case of anemia. Human growth hormone to, to treat a variety of diseases. Interferon beta for multiple sclerosis. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to take a personal moment. In 1995, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And the first thing that happens is first you cry. You think this is the end of the world. You write a new will. You buy a ranch house because you know that 10 years later you're not going to be able to walk. And you start doing what the doctors tell you. And what the doctors told me is to take intramuscular injections once a week with interferon beta. Avonex had just come out, wonderful product. Guess what? It controlled my disease. I did not have any exacerbations after that for 10 years. I knew many people that had a different approach. For a day and day and a half, they had all kinds of symptoms that did not allow them to get out of their house because interferon beta, as you know, is an extremely potent drug. They would stay home lying in bed, having pains from interferon beta now and its side effects, and at the same time losing a day or two days of their lives. I ask you a question. Is this really an improvement of quality of life? Is this really what NAE was saying when it says engineering new medicines to help patients? And who decides how do you help patients? Is helping patients allowing them to live only five days actively and two days not actively? That's improvement? And who makes that decision? The bioethicists? Why? What do they know more than the patient that wants to go out on a Friday or Saturday but is lying on a bed because the interferon beta has created all kinds of side effects? Now, in my case, I was lucky. It turns out that the doctors had made a mistake, and 10 years later, it was discovered that I had another autoimmune disease which was much more easily controlled than uh, multiple sclerosis. So uh, I don't take interferon beta, and I'm not multiple sclerotic, thank God. But it's not always that way. Other people suffer from this disease and they die younger and they end up, of course, in wheelchairs and with canes and so on. We owe it to our patients, we owe it to the world to come up with new and better medicines that will improve their quality of life, 
that will make them freer to live a regular life, that will give them their life back. Simply sustaining them in life is not the solution. And those of us who are biomedical engineers, especially as we get older and we realize the implications that we have in the societal environment, we make every effort to improve that quality of life. In the case of my development, as a result of this discovery in my life, I got very, very involved in oral delivery of proteins. And, and I want to tell you, I am not the only one. I want to bring two other examples, which are now public. Therefore, I'm not disclosing something improperly. One is a famous colleague for, from Caltech, who was also the postdoctoral mentor of Susie Pan, who is coming up, Mark Davis where something happened in his immediate life related to cancer, and it led to him getting into cancer treatment and coming up with new medicines and new technologies for treatment of cancer as a result of trying to save his loved ones. Mark Davis was a zeolites scientist before that, and yet he got into cancer. He has done absolutely wonderful work. Those of you who saw his recent paper on siRNAs in nature, you will see what I'm saying. The other one is Kaitan Kosla at Stanford, whose wife and child suffer from celiac, gluten intolerance. And he was the one who developed, a, created this tremendous program to try to see the effects of gluten on our body and how he could come up with solutions to this very important problem, to treatment of this autoimmune disease. So you can see how personal uh, incidents translate into improvements of the quality of life of our patients. In our case, the oral delivery of proteins is extremely difficult because of the acidic environment of the stomach and because of the possible degradation of the proteolytic enzymes in the GI tract. Nanoparticles are the solution. The nanoparticles are designed in a particular way to release these proteins almost intact as much as possible under the conditions to the epithelial cells and then pass them through to the blood. Here is a result with one of these formulations showing the biodistribution of insulin in the upper small intestine, lower small intestine, middle small intestine over a period of four hours, and you can see that indeed one is able to target this particular nanostructure to a specific site and release the desirable protein over that period. And you can see the pharmacological etiology here. Many people say, yes, you were able to lower the glucose, but that doesn't mean anything. On the left side, you're going to see that insulin is actually in the body within the first 15 minutes. And in fact, if you look at the area under the peak, that's a first significant indication that these systems work. These are the results of interferon. And every time I show them, and they are recent results, I, I really feel very, very emotional about them. Uh, the results are taken with the University of Hoshi in Japan together. We work together and with one of the Japanese companies and show you clearly that we are able to deliver transmucosally and orally interferon beta, hopefully coming up with a better method for administration of these drugs. Now, you notice that I use the word nanoparticles. Is nanotechnology the cure of everything? I would love to say that, but it's not. We have to be extremely careful. In the recent issue of Nano Day that just came up, I have this article on targeted nano delivery of drugs and diagnostics, in which, so I'm not tweeting today, but I'm, <laughs> I'm promoting, uh, in which I'm addressing really some of the major goals of how targeted nano delivery is going to improve our quality of lives. And one of the things that I show there is how liposomes and nanoparticles and related systems, often containing hybrids, often containing uh, a shell with uh, gold or silver, can be really targeted to deliver to specific sites, especially to cancerous tissue. It's a very important problem in our field. And I don't know if it will come up during the discussion but it is one other approach of engineering new medicines, the utilization of nanoparticles with biologically active tethers. Those tethers are called decorated structures, so we're talking about decoration of nanoparticles. 
and there is such a large number of scientific publications in the last few years. If you look, if you do a search, you're going to see really a large number of them coming also from individuals from this university, especially from Pat Staten and his group, and also other groups in the biomedical engineering department here, but also from other investigators at Utah, in our place, in Europe, at MIT, and so on. And the idea is to have these nanoparticles that can really be targeted to specific sites and deliver the drugs there. And you can do all kinds of biological uh, additions to them using, for example, uh, avidin and so on, biotin avidin, in order to create structures that carry specific drugs to specific sites. One other area that is of particular interest to me for the future is the area of system responsive therapy. And that is something that especially engineers will understand. Whether you're a mechanical or electrical or a chemical engineer, you have heard about how you can use control theory and control systems in order to control a particular system. The system in our case is the cell, or it is the body. And we're trying to control it when we go into an unsteady state operation. And the unsteady state operation is, of course, the presence of an undesirable analyte or another cause that will lead to a particular disease. So how can you control the system? Can you imagine if we had systems like this? Someday we would be able to either externally or simply by controlling internally provide treatment for a patient over a very long period of time. Someday. Not now. And not under the regulatory climate of the day. And not under the pressure, the financial pressure of the day. The systems that I'm going to describe in two minutes and then I will close are systems that will require many, many years of studies of proof. And there will be systems that can be personalized because they can be adjusted to really work for a particular patient. They are biomimetic systems. Biomimesis is a Greek word which means replication of biological function by non-biological components or systems. And it is a work that says that someday we might have advanced intelligent materials that will recognize a particular analyte, process the information, inform a particular device, which for the time being is a micro device, but eventually can be a nano device, and then start releasing. Wonderful idea. If I have a lawyer in the audience, he's saying yes. You will see how well those ideas are going to break, because we have to realize that these systems have to work for everybody. If they don't work one time, that would be the end of the life of that particular system. The idea is not totally new and it's based on molecular recognition. It was prepared, presented for the first time, guess what, by Emil Fischer, Nobel laureate of 1904 in chemistry, who said that someday we will have a particular molecular key with which we can open a molecular door. He said in a slightly different way. But basically here we'll have a system that will be recognized uh, only by a particular nanoparticle, microparticle, other device, and only then will the triggering occur. Here is a very, very early implementation of this idea in a system that I don't have time to work. It's a commercial system, and as a matter of disclosure, I had to say that I am involved in this particular company, and I do have financial interest. The system is called Affinimer. It's a system that is able to recognize a particular undesirable compound, in this case is glucose. The system starts expanding. As you can see on the right side, it starts rupturing and it starts releasing the glucose. And a more important implementation of this idea would be in the form of nanoparticles or microparticles with eight or nine different layers, where the external layer recognizes the analyte, it comes off, then a second layer starts releasing a particular protein or drug or whatever comes off, then a third layer starts recognizing more of the analyte, etc., etc., etc. So systems that really will be independent of pH, independent of temperature, they will be simply dependent on the presence of an analyte that is undesirable in your body. Imagine, for example, that you, have, you are uh, hypertensive, and therefore your angiotensin II concentration is relatively high. It will be able to be recognized by the first layer, 
the skin will come off and you will start releasing a drug to, to, to treat the high blood pressure. Then eventually you will have the second layer, the third layer, and so on. I'd like to close with a few uh, more industrial comments. Uh, as I said, in about half an hour we're going to have our panel. When you take this idea, which was developed in the laboratory, you take it to a company, a small company is using, usually discussing this. So, great idea. We'll put a few million dollars. How many million dollars do you think they can put in an idea like this? Two, three, five, ten? They cannot place a hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars. Then you start to, talking to the big partners, and the big partners say, Nicholas, have you ever done coating with nine layers in microparticles? Do you know how expensive it is? Do you know how difficult it is? Do you know how reproducible it isn't? And then they say, make it simpler. And that's when you realize what it is to take these great ideas that you will hear, you're hearing from me and you will hear from Susie Pan and make them applicable to today's industry, to today's government structure, to today's healthcare, and so on. Most of these ideas will be very difficult to bring to the uh, to the, to, to the company. And of course, we have here Dr. Montgomery from Gilead, who is going to address, I'm pretty sure, quite a lot of these problems. Then you hear about sensors. Yes, we can come up with micro devices and perhaps eventually nano devices that will have the ability to recognize a particular analyte and by some mechanical or other process allow the release of a particular agent. And I'm addressing that in a recent issue of Advanced Drug Delivery Reviews and in some other publications. But again, what we find is a certain negative response from the major companies who are not willing anymore to invest money for all this. So as I'm closing, I said there's a changing world in therapy. And there are a few questions that I would like to address to the panel and our audience, and to myself as well, and I don't necessarily have the answer. Who will pay for these advanced medicines? Who will do that? I'm working with a major Chinese company, uh, Japanese company, and when we started talking about a new development, that was the first question they asked. How is payment for that particular treatment done in the United States? Can we recoup our cost of developing this product? If we cannot, then, you know, we are not going to develop it. Will FDA approve them? I have a high respect for FDA. I think that without it, we would have a lot of uh, uh, not well developed products in the market. But on the other side, they have too many procedures. And it takes a long time. And the companies cannot wait for five, ten years before they have a product in the market. How many years to commercialization? That's the other major question. What about generic competition? This is something that is not going to be discussed very much today because we are talking about more advanced medicines. But the question has to be addressed. The big companies, the Pfizer's and the Glaxo's and the, all the major companies cannot continue working when they have this continuous generic competition. On the other side, I understand that the public wants the generic products. And I understand that the Hatch-Waxman Bill of 1984 is a very important bill that has changed the way most of us work and operate in our everyday life when we are sick. But at the same time, we have to ask the question, what about the generic competition of all these new medicines? Are these problems global? Yes, they are. And hopefully this will come up today. They are global. They are not problems only for the United States. And these days when you come up with a new medicine, quote unquote, you have to see how you can protect yourself throughout the world. And finally, who will cover the research expenses? That's something we don't address very much. NIH has been doing better these last few years than in the past, but there are still many products that they will not, uh, many, many, many types of research that they will not fund. Uh, we have major developments, the rise of big philanthropy. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been a major, major contributor to that. HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, has been really contributing incredibly 
to really the medical sciences in a more liberal way, both of them. But of course, the competition for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grants, the grand challenges as they are called, is really very, very difficult. This is one we just got an oral delivery for treatment of diseases in third world countries. And uh, I think this year it was, there were 76 out of 3,000. So that's give you an idea of the type of competition. So as I'm closing, I want to put also, with the permission of Dean O'Donnell, a little uh, ad for our own little meeting of the National Academy that's going to be on April 7th at uh, Austin on Engineering Advance, Advances in Biomedicine. And I want to conclude by saying that in my case, I have been lucky. NIH, NSF have supported this work for the last 30 years. Uh, being an immigrant to the United States, coming here in 1971, and being so generally supported by the American public and the taxpayers, I am particularly thankful to any, everybody, including all of you, for having given me the opportunity to really design new systems, new drugs, and new biomaterials and to really help patients in the world with our work. Thank you very much.